Preoperative assessment. Preoperative assessment is performed to allow us to provide safe anaesthesia tailored to the specific needs of the individual patient. It enables us to optimize a patient's condition and to make a perioperative plan. This has been shown to increase survival, decrease perioperative morbidity and length of hospital stay, as well as increasing patient satisfaction and reducing late cancellation of surgery, thus improving efficiency. It has multiple aims. Firstly, to identify specific risks to the patient. For example, are they at risk of respiratory failure post-op? Is pain management going to be difficult? Are they needle phobic, anemic? Will the operation result in blood loss? Should blood be cross-matched? Could they be difficult to intubate or ventilate? A patient with a high BMI may have a difficult airway and difficult venous access. Moving and handling may also be a problem too. The risks and benefits of surgery and anaesthesia need to be carefully considered and discussed with each patient. Surgery may not be in every patient's best interests. We need to ensure that every patient understands their own individual risk so that they can make an informed decision about whether to proceed with surgery. Any comorbidities should be optimised. For example, if a patient with chronic bronchitis is wheezy, they may need antibiotics, steroids or bronchodilators. Surgery may need postponing. A patient complaining of chest pains will need to be investigated in case they have ischemic heart disease. Excessively high blood pressure will need to be stabilised for a few weeks prior to anaesthesia. An anaesthesia plan needs to be formulated. Will the patient need a general anaesthetic or is it regional anaesthesia an option? Monitoring and pain management are also carefully planned, as well as any post-operative needs. For example, when can they eat and drink? Can they go home later? Where will they be cared for after surgery? On the ward or high dependency unit? Or should an intensive care unit bed be booked? Will they need a patient-controlled analgesia pump? Or will oral analgesia be suitable? Preoperative assessment is an ideal opportunity to communicate any preoperative instructions to the patient and ward nurses. This may include any fasting instructions or the need for anxiolytic premedication. Most patients will be advised to take their usual morning medication with a small sip of water, but the anaesthetist will advise if there's any medication that should be withheld. Lastly, for the patient it is a chance to ask questions and to raise any concerns. For the anaesthetist it is a chance to build rapport discuss the anaesthesia plan and gain verbal consent. The reassurance preoperative assessment provides does help reduce patient anxiety. Preoperative assessment is a team approach. GPs know their patients well. They can optimise any chronic diseases prior to admission to hospital. This may include treating anemia, optimising respiratory function or controlling hypertension. They can also provide advice on weight reduction, exercise programmes, smoking cessation and improved nutrition. The surgeon will have either seen the patient in clinic or on the ward. They may therefore have already started the process of arranging the appropriate referrals or investigations. Junior doctors and specialist nurses may see patients in a preoperative assessment clinic a few weeks prior to surgery, or on the ward the night before, or on the day of surgery. Junior doctors clerk in the patients by performing a thorough history and examination, arranging for routine investigations and they make sure outstanding results are chased. Junior doctors are often the first doctor to see a patient after admission to hospital. Their role is vitally important as they need to ensure that their patient is safe to undergo anaesthesia or surgery. Any problems they identify must be promptly highlighted to the surgeon and anaesthetist. Early communication of problems can prevent late cancellations. Anaesthetists like to know about any problems as early as possible. Please let them know. The anaesthetist may see the patient in a specialised preoperative assessment clinic a few weeks prior to surgery, or on the ward the night before, or on the day of surgery. Each anaesthetist is ultimately responsible for the preoperative assessment of their patient. Preoperative assessment is performed just like any other patient assessment. This includes a history, examination, investigations and review of the medical notes. The operation to be performed should be confirmed. This includes ensuring which side is being operated on and the reason for the operation. This is important as it may indicate further pathology that needs investigation. For example, a patient with a fractured hip may have had a blackout which led to their fall. This could have been due to an arrhythmia or a myocardial infarction. Their past medical history needs to be reviewed, paying specific attention to the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. We want to ask them specifically if they get chest pains or tightness. 
If so, do they have a GTN spray and how often do they need to use it? Do they get dizzy spells, blackouts or palpitations? Also, ask about breathlessness, cough, sputum production or wheeze. How often do they need to use their inhaler? Can they lie flat? Or are they too breathless to do this? Exercise tolerance must be asked. This is important as it indicates the patient's physiological reserve to deal with the effects of surgery and anaesthesia. Poor exercise tolerance may reveal undiagnosed cardiorespiratory disease. So ask what their exercise tolerance on the flat is. Can they manage stairs? How many flights? What stops them from going any further? Gastroesophageal reflux is important as it means the patient is more likely to regurgitate and aspirate gastric contents during anaesthesia. Patients with reflux are usually intubated for their airway protection. Anaesthetists always ask about this. A surgical history allows us to assess whether the patient has had any previous problems with anaesthesia that we can try to avoid. Examples of problems may include post-operative nausea and vomiting, adverse drug reactions, difficulty with ventilation or intubation, a difficult to insert spinal or epidural, difficult intravenous access, awareness, needle or mask phobia. Drug history and allergies are both important to ascertain. Latex allergy is relatively common, so it's important to ask about. Latex allergic patients are generally put first on the operating list in a theatre that has been clear of latex for at least one hour. Being a smoker increases the risk of problems after an operation. There is an increased risk of bronchospasm and laryngospasm due to airway reactivity, as well as an increased risk of sputum production and retention of secretions, which increases the risk of post-operative pneumonia by six times. An accurate alcohol history is also important. Patients who abuse alcohol are at risk of alcohol withdrawal and may have other alcohol-related medical problems. Acute ingestion significantly reduces gastric emptying and increases the risk of aspiration. It's important to ask about any illicit drug use or the use of any non-prescribed drugs such as herbal medicines. Do you take any non-prescribed drugs is one way to ask this without causing any offence to your patient. Opiate misuse results in tolerance and thus an increased opiate requirement for analgesia. It is important to make sure that patients are adequately fasted prior to anaesthesia. Anaesthesia blunts the protective airway reflexes, so unfasted patients are at risk of regurgitation of stomach contents and aspiration. On the other hand, prolonged fasting should be avoided, so give the patient a drink or intravenous fluids if you suspect surgery to be delayed. Fasting times follow the 246 rule. Two hours for clear fluids or juice with no pulp particles. Tea or coffee with milk are now considered safe up to two hours before surgery four hours for breast milk, and six hours for food or milk. A general systems examination is then performed, assessing for anaesthetic risk, documenting current disease state, and looking for any new findings requiring investigation. Airway assessment is performed by the anaesthetist, who reviews previous anaesthetic charts. They need to know about any loose teeth, caps or crowns, which could be damaged. Difficult face mask ventilation may occur if the patient is obese, has a thick neck, bushy beard, or no teeth. A difficult intubation is predicted by a number of factors. These include reduced mouth opening, reduced neck extension, the pres presence of a receding jaw, buck teeth, or a short thyromental distance. The anaesthetist asks the patient to open their mouth and to protrude their tongue. The view scene is given a Malam Patti score. The higher the score, the more difficult the intubation. Many patients do not need investigations for minor procedures. Investigations requested depend on the patient's age, comorbidities and type of surgery. National Institute for Clinical Excellence guidelines are available, which can help you decide which investigations to perform. These include blood tests, urinalysis, an ECG and chest x-ray. A sickle cell or pregnancy test may also be indicated. Additional investigations may be required depending on history, examination findings and the grade of surgery. These may include an echocardiogram, myocardial perfusion scan, troponin, pulmonary function tests or arterial blood gases. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis may need a C-spine x-ray to assess for atlantoaxial subluxation. All patients are given an ASA score preoperatively. ASA stands for American Society of Anesthesiologists. 
The ASA score classifies them according to their pre-existing medical condition. It is a subjective score, but there is some correlation between ASA score and mortality. The higher the score, the more unwell the patient is. This table shows the ASA classification definitions and associated mortality, but in practice there are many other factors that influence mortality. In summary, we've covered why preoperative assessment is needed, its aims, who performs it and how. We've also covered fasting rules, airway assessment and ASA classification.